You're listening to A Book With Legs, a podcast presented by Smead Capital Management. At Smead Capital Management, we advise investors who fear stock market failure. You can learn more at SmeadCap.com or by calling your financial advisor. Welcome to A Book With Legs podcast. I'm Cole Smead. I'm the president and a portfolio manager here at Smead Capital Management. At our firm, we are readers and book junkies. It can be said that leaders are readers, and we believe books provide us a great source of information for filtering what is and isn't important for us as investors. Investing is the last great liberal art and the best way to spend a lifetime of learning. This podcast is for readers, thinkers, business-minded people, and investors who want to grow their knowledge from great authors and their writing. Charlie Munger often talks about using multiple mental models and analysis. Our aim for this podcast is to help listeners test Munger's theory in business, markets, and people. Thank you for joining us for this episode. We are going to discuss the investment writing from the mid-2000s and look back to what is timeless in investing. Joining me today is Richard Oldfield to discuss the second edition of his book, Simple But Not Easy. To give all of our listeners a little background on Richard, uh, he is the founder, a partner, and a non-executive director of Oldfield Partners, where he was CEO until 13 and chairman until 2022. Prior to that, he was the CEO of Alta Advisors. Uh, he joined that firm in 96 through 05. He started his career at SG Warburg, um, eventually becoming part of Mercury Asset Management, not far before uh, it, it was purchased by Merrill Lynch. So. Um, Richard, uh, it's great to visit with you today. Um, can I, do you mind if I tell you how I came across uh, your writing? No, do call. Very good to be with you. Do tell. We had uh, just brought a new colleague on in London. Uh, his name actually happens to be Richard as well. And he mentioned your name and your book. And I, I, to, be, to be downright honest, and I, I, I feel bad even saying this, I, I'd never heard of you. And then I got into your book and I thought, how had I missed you all this time? <laughs> so I just, I, I'm really glad to be able to visit with you. And I, I really loved your writing. And I just want to tell you that right from the get go. Why did you originally write this book? And then why update it uh, in, in, you know, what you've added since then? Okay, well, the second part is very easy. It just badly needed updating because I wrote it originally in 2007, um, sort of on the train at cafes, waiting to see people in odds and odds and ends of time for the sort of year and a half up till 2007 when it came out. And why did I write it then? I wrote it because I like writing and also because I wanted to give vent to all the prejudices about investing, which mm -hmm. I had um, accumulated over the, over the preceding however many years it was, 30-odd years. Uh, and then in 2020 or 20, in 2020, I think, um, the original book had sold out after a number of printings. And it was, there was just a lot, which given that we'd had a global financial crisis and a few other things happening in the meantime, mm -hmm. seemed to need an update. And so I wrote a sort of 60-page update looking at the themes which there had been in the original book and, and, and saying where I'd gone wrong and where there appeared, it still appeared to be true. I think this book does a, a really good job of fighting norms, both for investors as well as the investment management industry itself. So to pick up on one of those early in your book, um, you've obviously traveled a lot for your work. You've you know, met with companies in the United States and all over the world. Um, I, I could kind of gain from your writing. Most investment managers brag about their intense on-site research in these foreign countries, but you say travel narrows the mind. Can you explain this early point in your writing? Yeah, I think that um, I, I put it in an extreme way to make a point. But the point is that very often I've found in my career, you think that you know a company because you've been to see it a few times. You think that yeah. you know a country. <laughs> You think you, you think you know a country because you've been there a couple of times. And, I mean, I'll give you two examples of why that isn't so. It, in 1997, I went to Russia for the first time, and I came back intoxicated by the, the romance of the place mm -hmm. and, uh, and keen to invest. And that was shortly before the 90% fall in the market. <laughs> uh, and, the, and the danger of going to a place is that you think you've got some edge over those who who haven't been, and you think that uh, you think you are suddenly an expert, but in fact you're a tourist. And the same really applies to companies. I used to go and see Walmart in the States when I was head of the US equity team at Mercury. 
uh, and I went, I think, two or three times. Um, and in those days, you could get a you could get an appointment with the CFO, and the CFO was hugely uh, impressive and uh, and compelling. I remember him pointing to his old car in the in the car lot outside, and one and he had a a room without any carpets, as far as I remember, a small room. And I thought, gosh, this is really the, the illustration of the Sam Walton cost-cutting ethos. And I would always come away thinking that a company like Walmart or another company that I'd visited was worth a couple more on the multiple than before I'd gone. But it wasn't. It was just that CFOs and CEOs are terrifically good at spinning the company's story. And there's a danger of... Uh, of, of Getting persuaded by the, the the silvery words of the of the guy you're seeing, um, rather than what I think is necessary, which is the old kind of Ben Graham green eye shade mm -hmm. job of sitting at your desk and working intensely on on the company and reading intensely about it and doing doing intense work on on the report and accounts and so forth. I think that is you know essentially the job of the investor, rather than going to see managements and being persuaded by what they say. I think one should be persuaded by what they do rather than by what they say. And I've had, I mean, a few other incidences where it's been too easy to, to be persuaded by, to be too credulous about what management says. Uh, and so that's why I think a bit of distance is a very good thing. You want to keep your distance both from trading, both from the cacophony of the, of the trading floor at these very busy, very big investing institutions where there's an awful lot going on all the time and you feel, you feel dragged into doing things yourself rather than sitting quietly. And also distance from, you, you need to keep your distance from the rhetoric of, of company managements. So the unthinkable can happen, as you point out, uh, in your book. And I, you know, I, I'd never heard of this story because I'd never looked at the company back when um, you discuss it. But I think it's very interesting as we think about today, the dynamics of Russia, as well as China, I would argue. Can you explain to our listeners what the company Yukos was and why it was so attractive and, and why the unthinkable can happen? Yes. Yukos was the, at one time, the first or second largest oil producing company in Russia. And uh, its chief executive was uh, uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky. And Khodorkovsky was uh, unwise enough to make um, political noise and to oppose the Putin regime. Uh, and he quickly became persona non grata to the Putin regime, which mm -hmm. targeted him. In due course, he was, he was arrested and he spent a lot of time in, in prison. Uh, and Yukos um, was a... a publicly listed company in Russia. It had ADRs, it had an enormous international backing. Um, and it was trading at a valuation which was a tiny, tiny uh, ratio to its assets and to, and to earnings and cash flow and so on. Yukos was a tremendous lesson that one should, never, one should never dismiss the possibility that something can go disastrously wrong, particularly in an emerging market like Russia, in a, in a market in which the democratic tradition is not, re is not there sure. and where there, is, where there is an autocracy. Uh, because in fact, what happened was that Yukos was driven into the ground by Putin and then uh, the assets of Yukos were sold to another Russian oil company. And there's another lesson in the short-termism of most of us in the West just a year and a half after the, uh, effectively, the appropriation of Yukos by the Russian government through this other Russian company, uh, that, that company was, uh, had a, an, a secondary offering, which was sponsored by Western investment bankers like Morgan sure. Stanley and so on. So the crash of 87 stuck with you uh, in an indelible way, uh, as you write about your book. But you learned a very different lesson from the crash of 87 uh, than I think most people did. Most people think, oh, I wish I could have avoided that. And that was not your lesson. No. I mean, in 87, there was a tremendous storm in, uh, in the southeast of England at mm -hmm. that time. And I was actually on holiday when the storm happened and the great crash in markets happened. Mm -hmm. uh, I was head of the I was head of the U.S. equity team. I was somebody rang up while I was looking at all the fallen trees on our, in our garden, and uh, and said the Dow Jones is down by uh, five hundred points. And I remember thinking, Gosh, that doesn't really matter. Um, 
This is what really matters, as I looked at the chaos of fallen branches and trees around me. Anyway, I felt I'd better go back to work, even though I was still on holiday. And having thought before I went in, well, if the market is down by 25%, uh, then stocks are 25% cheaper than they were. Once I was back, I subscribed in the sort of general gloom. And we at Mercury uh, then made a huge mistake. I wasn't primarily responsible for it, but I certainly participated in it as one of the strategy team by going to 40% cash in global portfolios after the crash on the reasoning that the crash in markets would, uh, would affect the economy would affect consumer sentiment, therefore the economy would, would fall and, uh, and that in turn would affect the market. And that was, it was, it was both untrue because as it happened, uh, there was no real effect on uh, consumer sentiment and the economy recovered extremely quickly. It was also, in, in, in theoretical terms, it was specious because that's a piece of circular logic. If you're saying the market is weak, therefore the economy will, will be weak, therefore the market will be weak, there is something wrong because that is a spiral that leads you down to zero and nothing really can go to zero, except, except you costs, I should say. <laughs> um, so, so that was specious reasoning. It wasn't true. The economy recovered very quickly. Uh, we missed out on the recovery in markets. And that was a setback which um, affected performance for several years. It took us a long time at Mercury to, to get over that, that fatal blunder. And so, I mean, the lesson I take from that is to be terribly cautious about wholesale large asset allocation moves. I, sure. think you can make, I think you can make small moves and stand a good chance of getting them right, even though forecasting is so difficult and market timing is so difficult. But I think you can make small moves and have a chance. If you make a big move, it's almost certain that at the time that you make the big move, you are simply participating in, in a consensus which is pretty well established. Sure. Um, one of my favourite measures, I've, I've got, there are two technical measures of markets that I love. One is the Kopak indicator. I won't, I won't talk about that. But the Investors Intelligence Survey of Advisory Sentiment, you will know. Yep. Um, measure, it's a measure of the US market. It measures the, uh, the sentiment of investment advisory newsletters. And of course, they have a tendency to be bullish because investment advisors like to be bullish. At extremes, it is a remarkable indicator. When you've got um, a huge majority bullish, then you need to be deeply wary. When you've got a large majority, which is bearish, then there's an opportunity because people have already come out of the market. Sure. And, actually, and in fact, we've just had one of those, which you know, interests me a lot. A month ago, um, the, the bearish reading was 42%. The bullish reading was, I think, 25%. Sure. And that was, an, that was an extreme, which was last reached in March 2009. Sure. Well, that wasn't, a, that wasn't a bad time to be buying. And sure. so it makes me at least wonder whether returns from that point might be startlingly good over the next year or two years. Well, let, well, let me jump into that because I actually have that later in my notes, but I want to go into that because the other one we look at, Richard, is the American Association of Individual Investors or known as AAII. And to, you, to your point, later in the book, you talk about how, you know, we deal in a complex adaptive system, Okay. And one of the things we've noticed in the investor's intelligence, for example, if you go look at their sentiment, they're saying they're bearish, right? To your point, that was a very you know, low reading in terms of the bearishness over the bulls. Um, but then if you go look at the asset allocation or their equity weightings, they're very bullish. And so we, we often wonder, are too many people are paying attention to the numbers, right? And not the money, if that makes sense. Well, that may be true. I, I know, I know. Of course, I know of the AAII, and I have from time to time looked at it, and I've, I've just never found it seems to work as well as the investors' intelligence. But you may, you may disagree with that. As far as the money is concerned, um, I don't know about the allocation figures you're referring to. But in the UK, and the UK has been particularly hard hit in the last. Sure. 12 months or two, two years or even longer because of a combination of incompetent government, Brexit, sure. um, the, the fall in credibility of sterling, fall in credibility of the UK as a major international place. Those are the chief things which are affected it, alongside all the global influences of inflation and interest rates and so forth. Anyway, the UK has had a particularly rough time. And in the UK, I do know of funds. Uh, this is anecdotal rather than a sort of proper statistical study. Sure. But I know, I know of funds, global equity funds, Funds, which have had forty or fifty percent in cash in the last in the last few weeks, wow. uh, because because they've been concerned about possible redemptions, and so I I so I don't I don't know exactly where we are in 
terms of, of money allocation. But I sort of suspect you probably know that we've had a, a particular drama in the UK when um, the trust government was in power very briefly yep. uh, and, um, and produced a, a, a budget which was um, slightly bonkers. The interest rate shot up and there was a crisis in the pension fund market because of something called liability-driven investment, yep. which I frankly had never heard of before. <laughs> and what it involves, as you again probably know, now I know, but I didn't before, is that pension funds have been um, using derivatives to load up on interest rates, uh, on a fall in interest rates. And, and because they use derivatives and margin and so forth, um, they are then able to have more assets available to invest in equities, and indeed in, in fixed income. And when interest rates shot up, there were calls on the, uh, on the, on the margins, uh, calls for more collateral to back these derivatives, as a result of which the pension funds found themselves selling the most liquid assets, which ironically were UK yes. government bonds. Yeah. Um, and that was a very strange, that was a very strange business. So, so let's get to this idea of risk and kind of risk in the long run. You quote Jeremy Siegel's uh, work from his book, Stocks for the Long Run, uh, in your writing. Um, he pointed out that between 1821 and 1996, U.S. equities outperformed bonds in 72.1% of five-year periods, 82.1% of 10-year periods, and 94.4% of 20-year periods. I have to ask you this question. It's, it's a very theoretical question, but... Based on what you see today and in your career, which I, I you know, you've, you, you're kind of like the, um, you're like the Allstate commercial, Richard, you know a thing or two because you've seen a thing or two. You know, if I had to give you the proposition uh, to take a 10-year treasury, U.S. treasury paying over 4% today, or take the S&P 500, which is obviously a big basket of stocks, you know, knowing the numbers that they're biased towards stocks in the long run, like Siegel points out, which of those would you take right now? If I had 20 years. Uh, if you had 10, I'll give you 10 years. Oh, give me a bit more. Go on. Well, I just say it because, it, and, and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, is, um, you know, to your point, I, you know, like you, I'm biased towards owning stocks. I love stocks. I think they're the greatest thing God ever created outside of humanity itself, okay? I, I find it really interesting in that I'm that kind of person that's born owning stocks, die owning stocks. And I think we're at a pretty interesting juncture where the risk in stocks, not to your point, not necessarily outside the United States, but inside the United States has been the most aggressive we've ever seen. So in that discussion, I, I would take, it's funny, I, I sit in meetings with, with people and I say, I'd rather take the 10-year treasury because I know I'm going to make over four and I'm going to receive a lot less volatility. In other words, I could sleep at night know I'm making four versus, as you point out in your book, most people don't deal with that very well. Yeah, I think it's, well, of course, I, I was pushing for, a lo for longer because it'll take longer to get rumped. Oh, it's an easy game in the long run. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's take, take the treasuries first. Um, of course, as you say, if, you, if the 10-year yield is, is four and a half or whatever it is, then you get four and a half if you invest for 10 years and you wait for maturity. But I don't think the treasuries are a bargain at this level. Uh, there is, we've had however many years it is now in which interest rates have been um, below the rate of inflation. That is mm -hmm. not a natural position for them to be in. Correct. The norm, the no the norm which we will return to, Mm -hmm. is that interest rates are above the rate of inflation. So what will the rate of inflation be? I think we have entered a period which will last for some years in which the rate of inflation will not be as low as 2, not okay. as low as the central, central bank target. I don't think it will be as high as 10, but it could be 4 or 5, let's say. Sure. And if it is 4 or 5, then the yield on 10-year bonds ought to be 5 or 6 or even sure. 7. Agreed. That was the old relationship. Yep. And so I think you're... okay. Sit on sit on the on the bonds for ten years. You get your four and a half percent. But I don't think this is this is the peak in terms of yields. I think we will see better times at which you could buy your ten year bonds than now. Agree. And that slightly that slightly prejudices me in answering your question about which I prefer because I don't like treasuries very much. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> and therefore, so I think I can sort of I think I can relax into my usual prejudice, which is. Equities. I was taught by a terrific guy from Bear Stearns called George Hacker in the in the late seventies, early eighties, and he used to say, "Bonds are death, equities life." And uh, and I've always had that bias, which of course for long periods has been quite wrong, yeah. but I've always had the bias that that stocks in the long run, in Jeremy Siegel's terms, 
will do you best. And so I, I, even though the valuation of the SP is very high today, I would I'd go for stocks. I wouldn't, as you, as you know, I wouldn't go for a, I wouldn't do it in a passive way. I think there are huge dangers now in doing it passively. I agree with you. And that's, and I think that's, that's the distinctive point I think is interesting is I, in other words, what you're saying, you're completely right in my opinion. Um, but then again, I loved your book. <laughs> so, you know, do, do, you know, if you, I, again, it was, I didn't say you could own the Richard Oldfield portfolio versus the tenure because we all know what the answer is going to be versus the S&P. So let me pivot one more because you, you quote some, uh, and by the way, for people younger in their career, I mean, this, some of the people you quote in this book are people that, uh, you know, millennials need to wake up to. Um, uh, following on our discussion of this, you, uh, you quote Peter Bernstein um, you, you, out of your book in a note, December uh, 2006, entitled, What Rate of Return Can You Reasonably Expect an Update? Referring to his earlier article in the Finan Financial Analyst Journal in 97, the respect respected stock market commentator, Peter Bernstein, showed the total returns of U.S. equities in a variety of separate periods beginning when valuations were identical to that point. He found that there had been four dates in the past, in 30, 1935, 1959, 1966, and 1969, when the valuation in price earnings ratio of the Standard & Poor's Index for U.S. equities had been at the same level in October 2006. He points out the total return for each of those four dates to October 2006 had varied between 10.4% per annum and 11.1%, and between 5.8% and 7.2% after deducting inflation. So you're right, in the long run, it's an easy game. Now, let me point out something, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. And by the way, Siegel's book follows on this really well, too. The, the return of the S&P 500 from the end of 1969 to the end of 1979 was 5.87%, so obviously not bad money, um, but was negative in real terms. Uh, how do you look at those kind of junctures where, like you pointed out, we're going to have higher inflation, let's just call it, like you said, four or five. Um, the the S&P has got to make that just to get out of zero. Yeah. Well, I mean, inflation is a terrific complicator, and that's why um, central banks and governments are so keen to avoid it, because it's not just that uh, it makes it, it not nominal returns don't mean so much, but it's also that it is, it's unstable and unpredictable. Uh, and we have been for 10, 15 years, we've had the little bit of our brain, which is called inflation watch, we've had that bit switched off, and we now have to switch it back on. Yeah. We have, and that's both in among company managements uh, and also uh, among investors. Company managements have to have to become dynamic in their attitude to prices and to costs and procurement and so on. Instead of being happy in a consumer-facing business to fix prices every December, maybe twice a year, December and June, uh, suddenly you've got to be on the case all the time, watching to see where there are opportunities and where there is price elasticity and where there isn't. Sure. And on the procurement side, there are opportunities. So it's a huge complicator. I think that, that the, I, don't, I don't change my sort of view about where to be in terms of equities or, or bonds. The axiom that most people would, would abide by is that if you have moderate inflation, it's reasonably okay for equities. It's good for sure. equities. Uh, if you have high inflation, then it's bad for equities. So I think if you get to 10% inflation and more, which of course is possible, happened in the, in the late 70s, um, then you have real trouble. But if we settle, and this is actually what I think is really quite likely, uh, if we settle at a 4 or 5% rate for a few years before we then get it under control again and go down to three or so, then, uh, then I think that's not a bad outlook for equities, which at the moment are captivated by fear of inflation. So you have a great zinger um, in your book, and I'd never heard this before, so I, 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 I hope you came up with it because it's awesome. And this is part of, I say, my and our fear as a firm is that, to your point, in the long run, the bias should be equities. I agree with you, you know, bonds are death. You're, you're your, your, your former colleague was right. You say a baby is in an objective position to take a long-term view, but will not actually look beyond the next feeding time. Um, we say dogs chase cars and people chase stocks and they chase them up and they, and they, they, they run away from them when they go down. And, and that's, we look at that as the real danger to your point about um, once they decide they don't like stocks, they'll run away wholesale like they ran at them. I think that's completely right. That's a great fear 
for those in the business who have clients that are not long-term in Outlook. I mean, Jeremy Grantham is, is, is very good on the, on the tolerance of investors, uh, and his investors are relatively long-term investors, but he says three years is about it. Uh, so the short-termism of most investors is, is, a, is a problem. Knowing your clients is therefore very important, and having clients who you can be sure are truly long-term. So that's a fear for, for people in the business. But it's also a, trem- it's, it's a tremendous opportunity because the, um, I mean, I think that markets have become ever more short term in the 40 years I've been in the business. Turnover okay. yeah. has vastly increased. Uh, the information revolution has meant that there's an ability to be extremely short term. And that can mean seconds even or with these um, sort of robotic um, methods of dealing. Um, and even with human beings taking decisions, it can be trading over minutes, uh, and those would be traders. But investment managers, too, have got much more short-term because of the ability to cover the news so so readily and so immediately, the sort of CNN type of world that we live in. So markets have got much more short-term. To me, I think that is a fantastic opportunity for those who are truly long-term because it means that there is more volatility in, uh, in stock prices than there is in the underlying fundamentals. Yeah, as, B- as Bernstein points out in his writing, volatility tends to decide returns because in low volatility periods, we get high returns. And in, to your point, high volatility, the, the S&P tends to produce you know, low returns in effect. So I, I, I completely agree. Um, let's pivot. Let's, let's pivot because you're pretty critical of hedge funds and private equity, I would say, in general in your book. And, and when I say critical, you're critical in aggregate, not necessarily uniquely t- tied to firms. What, what do you see as structurally problematic for you know, investors in, say, private equity, for example? The, the basic problem is that the fees in both, in both hedge funds and private equity, are too high. The, the 20% performance fee was, I think it originated in the, the fee which sea captains were paid to take a cargo around the Cape of Good Hope. And they were risking their lives. Hedge funds, when they started, uh, introduced this 20% fee, and private equity, I think it was this way around, imitated. But on the whole, they're not risking their lives. <laughs> and... Um, uh, and, and so the, the whack that private equity managers, hedge fund managers take out of uh, the profit is just too large. That The slice of the pie leaves too little pie left for the owners of the money. Mm-hmm. In private equity, in aggregate, as you say, this is a criticism in aggregate. It's not a criticism of every hedge fund manager, every private equity manager, though it's very difficult to discern who are going to be the ones who produce in the future. Um, I think, by the way, there is slightly more evidence in private equity, repeatability of returns or repeatability of outperformance Mm -hmm. um, than there is in the public markets where uh, where that isn't the case. But in private equity, in venture cap particularly, um, on the whole, there probably is repeatability that if you go to a firm which has done very well, there is more chance that it does well in the future than uh, going to a firm which has not done well. You, you make an interesting point in the hedge fund section, uh, Richard. You, you point out that a good hedge fund manager has to be better than a good you know, traditional manager, a good long-only manager. Well, why do you think that, say, consultants or institutional investors don't think of that comparison like you point out? Uh, I guess it's for two reasons. One is that we are, as human beings, we live in hope. And we, are, we, get, uh, we get enticed by stories and by high returns, um, and we think, I'd like a bit of that. Sure. Um, I, want a bit, I want a bit of that. I'm going to have a bit of that. Um, and the second is that the, the, the thesis for hedge funds was that um, they stripped away volatility but still offered good returns. And in periods in which markets are falling, um, to, to get rid of the volatility and to, to have a steady return is extremely attractive. So I think those are the two reasons that people are drawn to hedge funds as a, as a diversifier, in other words, and also as an offerer of apparently good return. As, I, I think the diversification argument is probably true, but then to hold cash is also a tremendous diversification if you've got an equity portfolio. The high, re, the high return argument, I think, is specious. The average hedge fund return is almost guaranteed to do worse than the, the average uh, long-only manager. I'm talking about equity hedge funds, of course. Sure. 
Because in that section, you talk about, and I love this, uh, you, you dated me, uh, you made me feel like a younger man as I thought back through some of your writing. You mentioned Amaranth in your book. Um, Richard, I was a young financial advisor in Scottsdale, Arizona, when we had a hedge fund of funds come and make a presentation um, to us, uh, you know, at the, our, our brokerage firm at that time. And they commented it right while Amaranth is blowing up. We have exposure to Amaranth as a, as a disclosure during their presentation. And I think the other bias that, you know, we talk about long only managers underperforming and they go away and there's survivorship bias because of that. But survivorship bias in traditional managers is like underperforming. Survivorship bias in some of the hedge funds is like the investors lost all their money, <laughs> right? So I, I think about the, the risk reward relationship differently. Um, that, so to pivot from that high fee space uh, that you talk about to kind of you know more traditional managers, you talk in your book about high fees, lower net returns, all things equal. The counter argument that you point out uh, in that chapter is that low fees encourage a manager to take on too much business. Isn't this kind of the sad state of affairs of the investment management profession where it's really trying to put a fee together that the client will buy? I guess it is. There was a manager in London a while ago who um, managed on a performance fee basis only with no management fee. And that, that seemed rather heroic. And in fact, it was not a success because uh, what, it, what resulted was that the management was worrying the whole time about their business model. Sure. And so there's got to be a balance somewhere where the manager is earning a fee which is sufficiently profitable to be a good business, um, but not uh, a fee which uh, is so high that it deprives, that it deprives the the, the, the owners of the money from the slice of the pie which they should have. Sure. Yeah, because you, you, to quote your book again, you said the danger in your words is, quote, acceptance of this sort of business suggests that the object for these firms had become asset accumulation and retention with incremental fees dropping to the bottom line rather than strong performance, end quote. You see that, you see that so often. And you see it in the private equity world. And I think it's been very common that you have a, you have a, a manager that has a fund of um, X hundred million and they justify their fees on the basis they need their management fees to cover the cost. They then yeah. do a fund which is 5x, uh, five times the, fund, the size of the original fund, and they still charge the same fee. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. So jumping to your, um, let's go to your, your writing on indexation, okay? You wrote, quote, index funds have the serious disadvantage that be, they behave as lunatics, end quote. I, I'm, I'm like hands up worshiping God from your declaration, but I want you to explain to our listeners what you mean in those words. In indices were devised originally to give a benchmark for performance. They were to give an indication of how the, how the market was doing in precise terms. They were not devised originally as things which people could invest in. Index funds came later than indices. And the way in which uh, most indices work, and there are some which work in a very different way. The, uh, there are indices which are called fundamental indices, for example, that work differently. But most indices work on market capitalization. And so to give you an example, in, uh, in 2000, when the tech bubble was just on the edge of bursting, uh, the index committee of the, of the UK market took out a whole load of rather traditional companies from the UK index, companies like Whitbread, which is a brewer. Mm -hmm. uh, and they put in um, some tech companies um, which had done startlingly well in the previous six months or a year because it's market cap based. Sure. So if your market cap falls, if your price falls, your market cap falls, you drop out of the index. Price rises, market cap rises, you get into the index. The bubble then burst and over the next six months, um, the traditional companies went up by an average of 25%. And the, uh, the, the new companies which had come into the index went down by an average of 25%. And in September 2000, the index committee of the FTSE then went into reverse and they put back in the traditional companies which they'd taken out six months earlier sure. uh, at, a, at a lower price. And they took out the tech companies which they had put in uh, at a higher price. And so that's what I mean by lunatic. No individual investor would, would hope to behave in that way. Any, any, any investor would hope that they would behave in a completely different way. So, and therefore, if you tie yourself to an index, that's what you're tying yourself to. Sure. Now, realistically, we, we all know that the average fund manager will perform 
a little bit worse than the index because of costs and fees and because the market effectively is made up of professional investors in most markets. And so sure. it's a sort of axiomatic truth that uh, the market is a reflection of the average, the average investment manager. So we all know that on average, uh, the, the average manager will do worse than the lunatic. And so it may make sense to pin your pin yourself to the coattails of a lunatic, but you, you should know that that's what you're doing. And it may be, and I obviously believe it to be so, and you believe it to be so, it may be that the investor is able carefully, thoughtfully, to choose a few managers who, on, on, on average, most of whom uh, will outperform most of the time. They won't, sure. none of them will outperform. None of them will outperform all the time, and some of them will turn out not to perform in the whole life of uh, the, the, the period in which the investor is with them. I'll use another quote of yours because, um, like I, I probably pointed out already, your wit in, in some of your writing, you say, quote, uh, talking about benchmarks, you know, as you pointed out, benchmarks became indices um, that we, you know, obviously index funds and ETFs today, quote, they have been used as the drunk uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination, and during a period in which markets went down, provided little of either, okay? So, uh, you know, the idea that these were made and constructed to have this much capital tracking them, I think is an interesting point that you bring up that very few people talk about from a structural perspective. I think it has caused a, an imbalance, which is dangerous, okay? I think it's caused an imbalance and may now be an opportunity because what's happened is, in, if you take the S&P, half a dozen stocks have become a really major part of the index. It, mm -hmm. Six stocks have become, I don't know, 28%, something like that, until recently, of the index. Very few real portfolios will exactly, will have as, as much as 28% in those six stocks. If you've got a sort of 50-stock portfolio, you won't have six stocks constituting more than a quarter of the portfolio on the whole. And therefore, if uh, those six stocks begin to underperform, I think what will happen is that a year on, people who have hurtled into passive will be a little bit disconcerted and will say to themselves, well, maybe passive is all very good, but maybe we've got a bit too much of it. These active managers seem to be doing rather well. Perhaps we should have a bit more active. And then that becomes a bit of a spiral because if you move from passive to active, it's likely you're reducing your exposure to those half dozen stocks. Sure. And that produces, therefore, better performance by active managers than by passive. So I think there could be a kind of five-year opportunity in which active has all the advantage. Yeah. Uh, to your point, we saw a statistic recently. The interesting part is we didn't see as much index change in the recent, you know, two years, as we had saw, like to your point about the, the FTSE in the late 1990s in the U.S. and the U.K., um, we uh, obviously a few years ago, Richard, the S&P committee changed the sectors and, uh, you know, changed communication, for example, telecom to communication services. And we saw a recent statistic showing that if you comprise the old technology sector and said, what did it peak out at? it peaked out at 45% of the S&P. So you know, to your point, it's lunatic because they either replace the names at the wrong time or they conflate the exposures, <laughs> as, as I just mentioned. So um, let me go over to another point, that, that, to another point in your book that um, I, I, I just think this is in so, so much wisdom for investors. Um, you talk about volatility and you talk about it as a poor measure of risk. Um, you don't believe that... that Volatility is actually risk. You point out, quote, a client's real risk is to lose money permanently rather than diverge from a market return, end quote. I'd say that investors who are willing to accept volatility, uh, who, who, pardon me, who are unwilling to accept volatility never realize the rewards they should. Do you agree with that kind of view? I, com I completely agree. I completely agree. And I think many investors, of course, if you've got a very short-term outlook, um, either because that's emotionally how you're made or because of your circumstances, that you're sure. likely to need the money in a couple of years, then volatility is very important and you should be very cautious about it and therefore not invest much in equities. But I think many people, and the hedge fund industry has stirred up this sort of move, many people and institutions over the last 20 years have got much, much more concerned about volatility than they need to, given their very long-term outlook. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, I think that gives opportunity to those who do have a long-term outlook. And of course, it also means there are, there are periods of pain, uh, but the pain is worthwhile. The pain in the long term will be worthwhile. Yeah. Now, let, let me ask you, and I'll just ask for kind of like a, a snippet answer, because I think we'll talk about this later. But if I, if I pinned you down and said, Richard, how many of all the investors that participate in common stocks, let's just say generally in markets like the UK or the US, what percentage of those investors do you actually think can deal with volatility? Pension funds on the whole can deal with volatility. They're a large percentage of markets. Many, uh, many family offices can deal with volatility, and they are they're quite a large percentage of, of, of markets. I don't know the figures, but I think it's, I think it's pretty sizable. People okay. who are in, in, in circumstances in which they need not worry about volatility much. But they may have been persuaded uh, by industry participants, by consultants, by hedge fund managers, that volatility matters more than it really should. Sure. And I don't disagree. Even though, to your point, the structural uh, investor world would say that it should be higher, um, since I know that there is some uh, dumb person like me at the end of that rope, um, I tend to think that it's going to be fewer. Um, so, so you 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 pose a, a whole new you know you pose this um, you call it LTLO or long term long only investors um, of which obviously you're part of that camp. I would put our firm into that camp. Um, you write that they aren't index clinging and they generally run more concentrated portfolios. Um, and you go on to say that this implies a specialization, but it, it's actually ordinary in the approach to investing prior to 1980 as it was. Can you? explain, uh, you know, what the history was prior to 1980? Before 1980, the whole business of um, risk was, was regarded differently. The, um, there was no measure of active risk. There was something called tracking error. Tracking error measured the, uh, the degree to which an index fund differed from an index. And, and since an index fund should have the performance of the index, it was indeed an error. But tracking error became used as, uh, as active risk. And the emergence of active risk as a measure led people to be very cautious about concentration, to be very cautious about um, short-term performance, uh, and to have much more diversified portfolios, many more stocks than, than previously. Long-term long only was a phrase which was used for probably five or ten years uh, in the uh, in the. Uh, early 2000s, late 1990s, early 2000s. And it was a surprise to me. I didn't know that such a thing existed. Uh, and and it, it's fallen into disuse now. I don't think that phrase is used anymore. Yeah. But it really described, it did describe the way in which investors manage portfolios before the emergence of active risk and before, therefore, there became this over-diversification. And, and, and that's what I meant in saying that it was really... It's really quite an ordinary sort of investment. It shouldn't have been regarded as extraordinary and put in the alternatives bucket, as it was for a period in the, in the late 1990s, early 2000s. You, you advocate for investors leaving room for opportunism. Uh, and obviously, you're lending this to both individual investors as well as you know, stock pickers. Um, you wrote, quote, most of the best investment decisions are not based on a pre-existing strategy, but are thoroughly opportunistic, end quote. You go on to say... Quote, whole asset classes may suddenly have attractions, which a year earlier they didn't seem to have, end quote. You call this the red tape of their own strategic framework to the detriment of performance. Uh, For many investors in the Western world, that has been ESG, I would argue. In another example, um, that's, you know, obviously much more interesting to uh, a listener of this podcast in the UK, Terry Smith of Fundsmith fame said in his 22 semi-annual letter, quote, the one sector in the will never own category that did cost us by our absence was energy, end quote. Is that the kind of idea, like the ESG, the I never will own this space idea that you're trying to get at? Well, it, no, that's not exactly what I was meaning. I think ESG is, is a slightly, is, is different in that there you have a kind of moral, moral framework sure. which, which rules out investment in a large part of markets. And I think the, the negative way of, dealing with ESG, which is to say not investing, ruling out of the portfolio of certain sectors. Sure. I, I personally think that's a mistake. I think it's better to engage with companies 
where you think that they should be doing things differently sure. rather than simply not to invest. And also it leads you to make decisions which are really hard to make. I mean, Shell, Royal Dutch Shell, is, the, is one of the largest, perhaps the largest investor in renewables in the world. Sure. So not to invest in a fossil fuel company um, when it is producing the cash flow which allows it to invest in renewables, I think is... I think that's really questionable. And there's, um, it's certainly something that you, you, can, you can argue pretty vigorously one way or another. And I also am pretty averse to the hypocrisy of avoiding, for example, airline stocks if you fly on, an, if you fly on aeroplanes yourself. And I think it really does stick in the gullet slightly that some of the people who um, are most vigorous in, um, in wanting a, a reduction in fossil fuels and energy consumption uh, some of them arrive in their private jets at um, these conferences. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that wasn't... I think what I had in mind when I wrote that was something like the tips market in the States, which when I um, was uh, working at the family office, Ultra Advisors, in the, in the mid-90s, um, tips yielded uh, over 4%. Um, and the reason that they yielded quite so much was that it was a relatively new market. Mm-hmm. Uh, it hadn't really been... Um, properly institutionalized. Harvard University was the largest single investor, and I think another endowment fund was the second largest. But it hadn't got it hadn't got tremendous kind of popular appeal. It just hadn't been noticed and included in asset allocation models by a lot of investment managers. So I think I think I was thinking of being alert to that type of opportunity when sure. I wrote that in two thousand and seven. In your chapter about what to look for in managers, um, I feel like I should license your writing out. Um, <laughs> explain how common sense should dictate things like portfolio concentration versus, as we kind of hinted at earlier, how academia looks at that subject. The, I think that academia leads you to have hugely over-diversified portfolios where academic work shows that if you've got more than 15 stocks in the portfolio, um, the... Uh, and it is aimed at diversification. Uh, obviously, if it's all concentrated in one sector, then what I'm going to say doesn't apply. If you aim at diversification with 15 stocks, you pretty much get it. And every additional stock you add after the 15th does very little in terms of volatility reduction. So the, uh, the, that academic work, in fact, defends quite concentrated portfolios. But on the whole, academia then argues for much greater diversification because of idiosyncratic risk in a single stock. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I th- uh, that is a perfectly valid academic argument, but I think it's bad in real life because in real life, uh, concent- a concentrated portfolio leads to a concentrated mind and every stock mattering a great deal helps you in making decisions and improving the chances of you getting the decisions right. If you have a very diversified portfolio, then in real life, and I know this from experience, you begin to sell a stock, maybe the price falls away from you, so you stop selling. And then there is a rump of the stock which sits in your portfolio, uncherished and unloved, for what can be a very long time. And you get a lot of passengers, and they mean that you, you, you veer towards an index return, and you're not really trying anymore with a large part of the portfolio. So that is why I think the common sense leads to a concentrated portfolio and, as I say, a concentrated mind. Your section on environment, um, I believe, should be the Magna Carta for stock pickers with the investment community. Um, You point out things like the alignment of interests, location, and lastly, structure, um, for investing, um, uh, you know, for for these types of businesses, first on interest and location, um, wh- what do you? How do you think interest should be aligned? And then, secondly, what what are your thoughts? And you kind of touched this earlier, but just to go in a little more, wh- what do you think is important for stock pickers and and, and investors for location? Uh, well, in terms of interest, I think that's sort of straightforward. You want to see that the the people who are managing your money are invested in the same things yourself. So you want to see firms in which the managers own funds and, uh, and have the majority of their assets in the funds which they manage. Um, I once, in, in uh, 1995, I met a friend who is a hedge fund manager who had just had a disastrous year mm-hmm. and I commiserated with him 
And he said, oh, well, at least I didn't invest last year's bonus, which was something like 19 million, <laughs> 19 million pounds. At least I didn't invest it in my fund. <laughs> um, that, that, I, that, I think, is what you don't want to see. You want exactly. to see people in, who invest um, who invest in their own funds, and when they, when they do well, they invest more in their own funds. And in terms of location, I think, there is, I think there's something in being distant from the, the huge activity that there is in the city of London, uh, and on Wall Street, where you have thousands of people who come to their desks every day and they focus with huge intensity on what happened yesterday in markets and yesterday to earnings. Uh, and there is this tremendous temptation to do things all the time that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's very difficult as a professional to come to your desk, uh, get your cup of coffee, sit down, and at the end of the day leave without having taken any action at all. I think that... Uh, Inaction is, is very, inaction and plenty of research, so it isn't really inaction. Inaction is very often the best recipe, and overaction, overactivity, is the enemy of good performance. There are studies which show that very high turnover funds tend to underperform low turnover funds. I agree. I, I, to your point, someone sitting down while they're well, they have a stock down 25%. Um, they're they're going to learn nothing by watching price changes. Um, they'll probably learn way more that day from reading your book in the morning than any sell side reports to boot. Um, for, for, you know, you, you, you make an interesting point in this part for structure, okay? Uh, and I, I really want to highlight this because I think you're pointing out something structurally important for investors to look at or stock pickers to think about in their business. But you point how damaging... Um, that lots of accounts can be for an investment firm. I, I obviously agree with you completely. Um, and you point out how much benefit there is, be, be, uh, therefore, for someone to be dealing in a pooled uh, vehicle or a pooled um, investment fund. Um, I, explain the, the reasons why, because typically I think in our industry we see, oh, you know, funds are bad. Um, you know, investors want segregated mandates or separate accounts, but you're saying there's a lot of danger in that for the investment firm. I, I, I think there is. Um, if you have a lot of accounts, then uh, there is a lot more admin. There's also the expectation by each of those clients that they, they can have something special, that they can have something which differs from what everybody else has got. And that is, um, first of all, it's probably mistaken because mm -hmm. fund managers fund managers do the best they can for all their clients. And unless they're prevented by guidelines from doing so, they will sure. do the same for all their clients, therefore. Uh, and secondly, it is tremendously time-consuming. It means that you engage in, in, in conversations with clients about the very bespoke things which you might do for them. And there's a sort of artificiality about all that because, as I say, the, the best thing is that the fund manager invests subject to guidelines, all accounts identically. So it's time-consuming and it's distracting. Um, and a fund is, is just beautifully convenient for uh, the manager to manage, which means that the manager will be able to devote all the thinking to investment rather than to admin. Um, and, it's, uh, and it's also beautifully simple for the, the investor in it. So I'm very pro-funds. I am as well. I consider myself a fund company with some separate accounts, and I think that's right. Um, so let's let's pivot to some of your psychological things you talk about in the book. Um, you quote Charles McKay, uh, or uh, McKay, I should say, um, quote, men, it has been well said, think in herds, it will be seen, they go mad in herds, while they only recover their senses slowly one by one, end quote. Do, do you believe that the train has left the station from one of those periods of madness um, you know, looking back over the last two years? I think we've been through the mad... The, I think we've been through the really mad period. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're in a period in which there are a, 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 a probably unusual amount of very unpredictable things. Ukraine, COVID, sure. these, are not, these are not normal things to happen. Um, but I think in, in, in one sense, we have, we've been through the maddest period and we're out of it. The maddest period was when interest rates were practically zero and inflation was climbing rapidly. And sure. there's now a sort of realisation that this is not normal. Uh, we haven't yet quite got to the stage where, as we discussed, uh, interest rates are higher than the rate of inflation. But there's a sort of growing recognition that that might be the norm to which we do need to return. 
So I think we're perhaps a little bit less mad than we were um, a year or so ago. But a, a year or so ago, I think we had a ludicrous position. We had this crazy amount of, um, of quantitative easing, crazy level of interest rates. Central bankers had lost control completely. It's not clear that they've regained control yet. Sure. In, um, the, I think a fascinating thing is that the global financial crisis provided the means to deal with COVID because it was the global financial crisis which produced uh, zero interest rates and uh, quantitative easing and then the kind of advanced methods of quantitative easing which verge on modern monetary theory, which were then employed during lockdown. Uh, and had we, had we not had the global financial crisis and also all the technological progress which allowed us to do what you and I are doing now and sure. allowed us to have Zoom calls and to work from home. Had we not had those two things, the technological pro progress and also the quantitative easing and uh, zero interest rates, then how would we have dealt with COVID? We'd have had to deal with it differently. Correct. Uh, whether, that would have been, whether that would have been better or worse in terms of lives lost and also economic impact, I don't know because counterfactuals are always difficult to deal with, but it would have been very different. Yeah, and to, to quote C.S. Lewis, he calls it chronological snobbery to think that you or I today in 22 uh, can deal with this so much better than anyone in the history of time, which is they've all had to deal with their own problems. Um, it, psychologically speaking, you, you, you quote Keynes in your book. I'm, we're, I'm a huge Keynes fan. I, I gather that you are as well. You, you quote him, my central point is to go contrary to general opinion on the ground that if every, uh, if, uh, if everyone is agreed about its merits, the investment is inevitably too dear and therefore unattractive. Uh, we talk a lot about the power of psychology here at our firm. Um, it, 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 at these extremes of madness, to your point, isn't psychology probably the, the most, uh, or I, the, the, the thing you want to understand the most, and yet it's the toughest to understand? I, I completely agree, yes. Obviously, this, this has been, it's been so important in the in in the most exciting areas of, of the markets over the last few years where you've had companies that have come to the market with very little in the way of revenues and really stratospheric valuations you couldn't even really call them valuations because a valuation involves a ratio of price to something and it's not clear what the something was it wasn't revenues it wasn't earnings um what was it exactly <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, so, uh, and, and so, yes, I think the psychological part is huge and very, very difficult to sort of grapple with because when you have those kind of uh, bubbles in which um, prices lose all relationship with any fundamental, there's no reason why a ridiculous price shouldn't be twice its current level. It would be twice as ridiculous, but ridiculous is ridiculous. It, 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 it can be, and that's what, and that's what did happen. Mm -hmm. um, and now I think we've retreated from that madness. Um, not completely, probably, but we've retreated a very long way. So, so we've retreated so, so, so far that, you know, companies like Netflix now have entered the territory in which value investors can get seriously interested. Sure. Um, to your point about where we came from in the great financial crisis in terms of the economy, um, you talk a little bit about this in your chapter on forecasting. Um, you, you mentioned where the consumer was in 2006, how that was manifesting itself in deteriorating loan quality. You surmised at that time that it could affect consumer spending and therefore the stock market. Today, that type of, of analysis is vastly different. Um, just to quote some things, um, like debt service ratios today in the United States have really never been lower since 1980. Um, American households have actually more cash than debt today, which has never happened since the late 70s. How, you, how do you look at that view of the consumer, let's just use the US economy, for example, and, and how that might affect the stock market in comparison to 2006? Well, I think that's one of the reasons that I don't really share in um, what has been, uh, maybe until the last few weeks, a, 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 a general gloom. In fact, the Investors Intelligence Survey as I, as I mentioned, that sort of figures quite large in my mind. It makes me pause and think, well, you know, maybe, uh, maybe that, that, that we could have startlingly good returns. And if so, why would they be? If we looked back in a year's time, we'd had a 25% return from world markets. How could that be? What would need to happen? Mm -hmm. I think what would need to happen is 
uh, one, inflation would have peaked. Well, that seems reasonably likely in the near future. Um, and two, that we do not have a severe recession. And why would we not have a severe recession? Well, because there is very full employment. Um, and, uh, and as you say, uh, people are not so exposed financially as they were uh, back 15 years or so ago. I think that's perfectly possible. Um, and therefore, I'm not, I'm not too gloomy about the world economy. In the, again, the UK has been at the sharpest end of this. A year and a half ago, the Bank of England said that inflation in the UK would peak at 2.2%, and now we have 10% inflation. Uh, three weeks ago, or was it four weeks ago, in the, in the, at the height of the drama in the UK, which led to the resignation of the Trust government, um, there was a sort of hysterical feeling around and enormous attention was paid to the Bank of England's forecast that we would have five quarters of, of negative growth. I don't know why anyone should regard so reverentially the, the forecasting of the Bank of England or anyone else, really. Um, I, I don't have any faith in my own forecasts, but I don't have a lot of faith in other people's. I think it's important to be, to be sceptical about other people's forecasts. And, and so back to, back to your question, I think it is conceivable that things are just a good deal better than um, a month or two ago they seemed. The economy is not quite so, so badly placed. Well, yeah, and I, I wouldn't disagree with you. I think, um, to your point, the, there's a lot of gloom, economically speaking. Um, and what we find interesting is it's really the strength of the economies that are forcing the hand of the central banks. So it's almost like you want to be long the economy, but not the indices per se, um, which I think is kind of an interesting paradox. And in fact, in your book, you talked about, I think it was like being, um, I think uh, kind of like generally skeptical and, and always bullish. It was kind of a, a, an idea you played with. Um, let, me, let me pivot it one more time. You had one of my favorite quotes of Manius um, in there where you quote Scott McNeely of Sun Microsystems fame. Um, and you quote he, what he sp said at a Bloomberg conference about trading 10 times sales and how ridiculous that was based on trying to provide a return to investors. Um, interestingly, Richard, we had the pleasure of, I, I wrote a piece in September of 21 on that quote. I called it the McNeely problem and I used DocuSign. So when I read your book, I thought, gosh, Richard, Richard is Paisan in my book. Um, but then we also got to interview Scott McNeely um, in our, uh, a few months ago in our podcast on the book High Noon, which is the story of Sun. He, he was, in my personal you know, visit with him, he's skeptical. He was very skeptical of what had been going on in markets as someone that had, you know, had a look back before like that. And I think that speaks to the general madness, to your point that we've come out of. But it, under the hood of this, there could be some incredible opportunities. And you really explain in Vivendi's case how madness by executives particularly can cause just really poor out capital allocation and dumb things to go on. Your writing from that point to today on a subject like Vivendi has only proven to cause something that was really depressed because of someone else's stupidity to end up being an incredible investment over the next 20 years. I noticed you didn't update your Vivendi, but you should have because look how much money it's made. I, I, yeah, I quite agree. I quite agree both on, on opportunity and things where valuation is driven down to a very lo low level because of what is probably a kind of temporary, temporary misstep. And, and secondly, I, lo I love that McNeely quote. He finishes, doesn't he? He finishes, he says, what were you thinking? What were you thinking when you drove valuations up to this very high level of our stock? Yeah. Um, and I must say, I've got a particular kind of respect for managers who, who keep going, managing their companies uh, and, are, and are sort of cynical about the way their market, the market has driven up their share prices. Um, and he was one of them, of course. Yeah, so I, there's one story that I, I need you to tell um, because it's a perfect picture of the value investor's plight. Can you uh, explain to our listeners uh, what you explained, what it's like to be a value investor as you go to seek your seat in the first class section of, of the train. Sure, yeah. I was, this was very early in my days at Warburg's at Mercury Asset Management when I um, was asked to go and talk to some undergraduates at Cambridge University uh, here in the, in the UK. And, um, and so I went to Liverpool Street Station and I looked for 
uh, a first-class compartment because we've very kindly been given first-class tickets by, by, the, by the HR department. Um, and I walked nearly all the length of the train. And just before I got to the front of the train, I couldn't find a first-class compartment. I turned back thinking I must have missed it. And in fact, the compartment was right at the front of the train. And I, I, just, I think that is a, is a sort of very good allegory for how we all uh, can, can behave in markets, that just before the thing which you've been waiting for for all this time to happen, just before it happens, you give up. And that is, I mean, it's so frequent that that is the way things turn out because that's how human nature works. You know, people, are, people become very gloomy and the last person to turn gloomy is, is the last person just before, so to speak, the first class compartment is found. So, yeah, I've always, I've, I've always kept that in mind as a sort of cautionary tale for value investing. In, in, with, with cyclical companies where things are rough, they get rougher, they get rougher still, and you think, you know, I can't take this anymore. Um, so often that is the moment just before the turn. I, I agree. And by the way, I love it because it also puts out the idea, and this is true, and, and you point this out in things like it's not about intelligence um, and investing. Um, everyone has a first class ticket that they can punch. The question is, are they going to use it? <laughs> it, it to your point. Um, and, 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 and by the way, and, and you, to your point on cyclicals, I mean, we as a firm sat outside the energy market for almost a decade and we got involved in late 19. And to your point, Richard, we had to do that walk. <laughs> and, and, and it ended up being the first class ticket, but it was not fun doing that walk. And so I, I, I totally love that analogy. I think it's perfect for understanding great investing. Um, before we go, is there anything that we haven't talked about in our discussion, which has just been such a pleasure, I want to say, um, that you do think needs to be mentioned from, from your writing in your book? I think, I think you've, you've covered, you've covered um, um, well, probably practically every chapter. I, I mean, the great message for a value investor is, is the message that um, a guy who was a bit of a mentor to me, Peter Kundle, Used to used to recite, and that is what you need is patience, patience, patience. And in, if you're if you're if you're a true investor who has a portfolio which is very different from indices, has a particular kind of philosophy which is expressed in it, has has strong commitments, then there will be periods which are very painful. And we value investors have just been through a long period in which it has been very painful. Um, I'm very optimistic. It's it's turned, uh, but whatever, whether it has or not, the, the commitment and the, the patience that you need are one of the, are two, of the are two of the real attributes of, of proper investment, I think. So Richard, if people want to follow you and continue to uh, take your kernels of wisdom away, where, where can they find you? Where can they read you? Um, where would be the best place to do that? Well, they can't really find me because I, I stopped doing this actively. I, don't, I haven't managed portfolios since, 20, since January 2017. Um, uh, uh, my firm is called Oldfield Partners. I still write the quarterly newsletter of my firm. And so um, I think that is obtainable on the website. Um, that's, the only bit of, that's the only bit of me. The rest, is, uh, the rest is, uh, are bits of my excellent colleagues. Well, that's outstanding. Um, thank you again for joining me today. Um, if you are an individual or institutional investor looking for a common sense approach to investing or are a stock picker and want to think about how to model your decisions and firm, simple but not easy is a must read. You have to go buy this. Um, the, I love the ideas and the wit that Richard Oldfield shares. For our audience, if you have a great book that you'd like to recommend, like Richard's, email podcast at smeadcap.com. That's podcast at smeadcap.com. You can also send your suggestions to us on Twitter. Our handle is at smeadcap. Thank you for joining us for a Book With Legs podcast. We look forward to the next episode. Thank you for listening to A Book With Legs, a podcast brought to you by Smead Capital Management. The material provided in this podcast is for informational use only and should not be construed as investment advice. You can learn more about Smead Capital Management and its products at smeadcap.com or by calling your financial advisor.